All right, part two of our realism lecture for 11th grade. Uh, we reviewed the historical and social context, so now we are going to dive into the literature, the good stuff. So realism literature portrays ordinary life, ordinary characters, ordinary events in objective, factual ways. So there are a lot of narrators who remain free of subjective prejudice, of idealism, or romantic color. Uh, the literature is mirrored by the impact of science. So we have authors and narrators who kind of study their characters and settings um, and avoid bias. Uh, so realist literature draws on common life regular ordinary people with regular ordinary problems and we have this great new vocab word dedication to verisimilitude um, so think of verisimilitude as very similar uh, that it is an accurate depiction of settings customs manners and speech of a particular region or time or culture. So we're dedicated to recreating things as they are in real life. Um, and another key part of realism is that nature is viewed objectively and considered orderly. And this is a really big departure from the romantics who viewed nature as um, spiritual and mystical um, and definitely not objective. So continuing with traits of realist literature, uh, we have characters who have some control over their lives and over their destinies. They're able to act on their environment and um, have some autonomy rather than simply reacting to what's around them. And as opposed with romanticism, which is exotic and far away and distant, realist literature deals with the here and now. Um, we have events that are plausible. There's nothing sensational or dramatic. You know, Hester Prynne's long lost, supposedly dead husband isn't going to pop up after three or four years um, and discover a torrid affair um, and then like die when the affair is over. You know, that type of thing isn't going to be happening in realist literature. We're portraying common experiences, the world as it is, not as they wish it was, because they've seen the Civil War, they've seen how the world is, and they want literature that's going to respond to them where they're at. So in realist literature, we want to look to see, is the world controlled by nature? Is it controlled by fate? by blind chance, um, our humans, our characters, have some control in the way that they're walking through the world. Um, and before we go on, I want to note here that as we read some different realist literature this week, you should know that it is very, very um, varied. The movement is very wide. There are a lot of different authors who fit into realist literature, even though their writings are really quite different. So realism is a very broad label. Um, so you'll have to see how these characteristics can be seen in a particular work versus another work because it's not necessarily going to be the same. So our realist author, some names that we want to associate with this movement. We want to know that the masters of realism, those who really raised it to its highest artistic levels, are the first three names, Howells, James, and Twain. So each of these three realist authors really had different niches in which they worked. So William Dean Howells was a journalist from the Midwest, and he's really known for capturing that middle class spirit. So we're not dealing with the poor or the working class. We're dealing with that middle class um, from your classic Midwest. So Henry James is very different. He lived much of his life abroad, so he was an expatriate. And his writings deal far more with psychological realism than Howells or Twain. So while he is an American author, we're starting to see his characters go across the ocean. He deals with a lot of European characters um, 
And so that's something that really sets him apart from some of the other realist authors here on this page. So we also have Mark Twain, who we know spent a lot of his youth along the Mississippi River, and he embodies that frontier spirit. Um, and I know we kind of said the, that the frontier was officially kind of gone or disappeared in that 1890s census, but the idea of the frontier still lived on. And we can see in a lot of his writings, if you know uh, Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer, that there's still that spirit of adventure um, that he really capitalizes on in his writings. So we also want to know with Mark Twain that he's not just a realist, he's also kind of a sentimentalist. So he kind of bridges the gap between romanticism and realism. But while his characters go through some kind of fantastical adventures, I'm thinking about Huck Finn, um, the writing style, the diction, and the tone that he uses, the way he recounts those stories is a very realist style. And so that's why we kind of put him in this category. Continuing, we have Upton Sinclair, who's most well known for his novel, The Jungle, which focuses on um, immigrants who are working in these really horrible, horrible conditions in a meat slaughterhouse in the city. Um, and things are brutal. We're seeing like the, the horrible sides of industrialism, of this new um, meat packing industry. We have characters losing limbs and living in these horrible slums, and it's super grim. Uh, we also put Harriet Beecher Stowe in this realist category, her novel that started the war. Um, and we have our first uh, African-American writer, I think that I've had on our one sheets, and that's Paul Lawrence Dunbar. He wrote sh uh, short stories and poems about black life. And a really significant thing about his writing is that he did it using an African-American dialect. Um, and that was something that was totally new for for American writing at this time. So the last name here is Ambrose Bierce, and we're going to read some of Bierce this week. He was a veteran of the Civil War. He was a journalist and a writer, and the short story that we're going to read by him is called An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, and we're going to see a lot of the journalist in him and a lot of the Civil War veteran. Um, I really love this short story. It's kind of got like a creepy feel to it. I'm not going to give anything away. But the last thing I want to tell you about Bierce is that he is also known as Bitter Bierce because of his very kind of sardonic, cynical outlook on life. Moving into naturalism. So if you remember, we said that romanticism had like an angsty younger brother that was dark romanticism and realism has an angsty younger brother as well called naturalism. So naturalism was kind of born out of an imitation of the French writer Emile Zola, who approached fiction with a very journalistic, almost documentary-like writing, and a lot of it is just based on atheistic evolution. So if he's recording the movements of characters and conflicts, he's doing it like he's recording wildlife, you know, human is just um, an animal moving off of instinct. Um, so there's a very clinical documentary like approach to naturalistic writing. Um, so we call this determinism. When we're applying Darwinism to literature, we call it determinism. So kind of at the base of this writing is the belief that life is controlled by natural forces that humans cannot change and cannot understand. Life is controlled by the laws of evolution. So free will is entirely an illusion. It doesn't actually exist. When I act in a certain way, it's because of the environment that I'm in and my hereditary background. So it's based on what's around me and my DNA, and there's nothing that I can do to change that. So really, I have no free will. I'm just an animal acting to my setting and to other animals around me. So if we look at the basic tenets of naturalism, the universe is considered unfeeling 
and chaotic, and man is accidental, insignificant. His existence doesn't mean anything. There's no spiritual or universal or eternal meaning to life. And we can see a lot of the impact that Darwinism is having in this literary movement. So man is just kind of stuck in this big web of social and biological circumstances that cannot be escaped. So again, man is just considered an animal driven by instincts, emotional instincts, survival instincts, and I think that this movement is really significantly darker than dark romanticism, but it's definitely a movement that still uh, is active today. So some further characteristics of naturalism. In naturalist literature, we're going to see bleak depictions of lower class life of poorly educated characters, typically in urban settings. Uh, we're going to find kind of an absence of religion in these writings, or religion is going to be exposed as kind of an empty shell. Um, the universe is perceived as a cold and heartless and godless machine, and we're going to see a lot of survival motifs in this writing. Man is going to be attempting to survive nature or to survive himself, and we're going to see a lot of violence in naturalistic writings. So again, the, the universe is big and cold and heartless, and man is small and insignificant and entirely not in control. So we need to recognize this as a very big difference between naturalism and its big brother realism. So in a realist writing, man can act on his environment. He has some sense of control over his destiny, and that is not the case in naturalism. So when we're talking naturalism, we're looking at Stephen Crane, Jack London, and Theodore Dreiser. Um, Stephen Crane is most well known for the Red Badge of Courage, which deals with soldiers' experiences during the war. Um, Jack London is a really popular uh, kind of more natural setting author. We see his books out in Alaska and the Gold Rush. Uh, man's conflict is more with nature rather than Crane's conflicts with war. Uh, lastly is Theodore Dreiser, and in his novels we see a lot of critiques of the American dream. I want you to note the description of what happens in an American tragedy um, where a man is kind of offered everything that he possibly wants in the marriage to a wealthy woman, and so he kills the girlfriend that he has, is put on trial for murder, and killed in the electric chair. So we have this idea that characters are just making choices based off their animal instincts and based off their environments. And so the main character of that American tragedy is just kind of stuck in this cold, uncaring universe and this uh, capitalistic society where he's just kind of being blown around and ultimately um, when he dies it's not really something that he really could have ever had any control over anyways. So our happy colorful offshoot of realism is regionalism and this is where we have fiction and poetry that are located in specific ge geographical sections of the country. Um, so whether we're in the, the West or the Midwest or the South, we are looking to capture the essence of life in that region, looking at characters, dialects, landscapes, customs, beliefs, dress, all of the features that change from location to location. And some of this is based on the fears that as cities become more and more industrialized and standardized, that local folklore and traditions were going to be forgotten. So regionalism is oftentimes called a uh, local color, and there is somewhat of a distinction between regionalism and local color, but I don't really care what that difference is, so we're just going to use those terms as the same thing. So when we're looking at regionalist authors, we can see Mark Twain is both realist and regionalist, and he really deals with that river 
that kind of divides the country, that river area. Um, and then Bret Hart is focused out on the West. One of his most famous um, short stories is The Outcasts of Poker Flat. And we have these new kind of very realistic characters. We have low-life characters, gamblers, prostitutes, robbers, and at the time, this was really very revolutionary. Um, and he is kind of known for starting to develop these um, derelict characters or these delinquents who have hearts of gold. So that's kind of a new literary trope that has its birth in American regionalism. In the Midwest and in the South, we have female authors. We have Willa Cather and Kate Chopin. And we're gonna be reading some Kate Chopin, um, particularly a short story called Desiree's Baby. She focuses on kind of the Louisiana Creole area down there. But if you remember, I think there's a good chance that you probably read the story of an hour by her in maybe ninth or 10th grade. So you have read some Chopin before and we're gonna do a little bit more with her this week or next week. So the last thing I want to do is give you an overview of how characters are portrayed. We can see that the Romantics saw the individual as idealistic, as the potential for being godlike, while our realist authors see the individual simply as a person, somebody who can make choices, somebody who can act on his environment. And then we get to our naturalists, where our individual is just an object who is thrown around by fate and nature and somehow there's some heroism in striving against your fate even if you know it's hopeless. So there is our overview of realism, regionalism, and naturalism.